Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, um, people from near and far, you are now listening to another episode of the much anticipated Casual Friday segment on Nick's Film School. Uh, you have two of the three regular casuals as well as the greatest general manager in the history of all general managers, one GMAC. Um, yeah, we are here to talk Nick's basketball with you guys, good and right into the playoffs and, you know, just roll around and do things our way, the casual way. So I'll get started right away here. Um, GMAC, you're our guest today. So GMAC, how are the vibes, my friend? The vibes are warming up in the bullpen because apologies to those of you that don't like America's pastime, but baseball returned to our television sets and to our ballparks today. So shout out to baseball, just me from me personally to baseball, uh, but also shout out to the Knickerbockers who are hopefully going to give us a lot of months to not think about our local baseball teams here in New York, because it may end up being a long summer uh, if things go the way that I anticipate for my team and how things look early for the other team. But the vibes are warming up, Mensa. I'll say that. All right. Um, we should put like an, an editor's note somewhere in there for busy, like to skip the first <laughs> maybe three minutes of the podcast. Because yeah, um, baseball is back, which is great. Um, normally that's good for one team in New York, not so good for the other team. Um, our team, the New York Mets. Um, but yeah, I mean, the vibes are definitely warming up because the New York Knicks are getting ready for a playoff run right when um, we will know a lot about the Mets and the Yankees this year. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can remain distracted as long as possible, no matter how the baseball teams in this town do. So XJ, my friend, how are the vibes? What's going on, guys? Uh, GMAC, we brought you on here as an honorable casual. And the first thing you do is talk about baseball. Yes. I was asked how the vibes are. I watched yeah, like that's... three innings of the Yankees before this. <laughs> so that's how the vibes are. The only reason I'm objecting is because I'm not excited about the Yankees season. I think that we got two mediocre teams in New York, but where we don't have a mediocre team is in the NBA. We there have we an go. excellent team. Uh, the vibes for me around Nick's land as they often are, are conflicted. Uh, you know, I, I want to be so hype and so excited right now. The Knicks are eight and three in their last 10, just took sole possession of the three seed. Mitchell Robinson just came back and is looking good. Everything's been going their way recently, but I, I just can't wonder. I can't, I can't help but wonder and worry about OG and Anobi and to a lesser extent, Julius Randle. And I only say to a lesser extent with Randle because. I think the Knicks are still the second best team in the East with OG with or without Randall. But I, I honestly don't think I'd pick them against Milwaukee with Julius and without OG. So, but uh, you know, they still need both of them to reach their, their ceiling potential. But yeah, I just think, I don't know. My point is that I'm, I'm very excited about everything that's going on, but you just don't always get a chance to be this good. And I'm just not taking it for granted. I don't know what Deuce McBride's going to do next year. I, I don't know what Dante DiVincenzo is going to do next year. I like these guys are playing out of their minds. I think I know what Jalen Brunson is going to do next year, but who knows? Like you just don't always get a chance to be this good. And we have 10 games before the playoffs. I just really want these guys to get healthy. <laughs> um, but you know, this is probably like a personal issue for me, not being able to live in the moment <laughs> because I'm always thinking about what's next. But yeah, that's, that's, that's where the vibes are for me. They're conflicted. I'm excited. I'm happy, but I'm just, I'm just, I just really want to get the guys back. All right. Well, before we address uh, the vibes from you, I have two quick corrections. The first one is that the Knicks are not eight and three in their last 10 because that would be their last 11. Uh, I, heard seven. I had no idea. If we were Listen, I'm that. the math guy. And uh... <laughs> oh, you know what? That's a, he's the math guy. They're eight and three is now 10 now. Yeah. Okay. Well, here we go. Yeah. yeah I guess uh, EPM has given us an extra win. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> <in the> last... <laughs> That's what happens when the analytics exactly. love you. They give you an extra win within 10 games. Yeah, that's what the E stands for. Extra. As for and extra the, exactly. the second correction, which is not as um, which is actually a little more serious. Um, you said that the, that they are um, we have we don't have a mediocre team in, in New York. And I am so sorry. But the Brooklyn Nets are in New York. Ah. And <laughs> hey, that is hey. a mediocre basketball. I don't team, know that they're mediocre, man. So that's the thing. <laughs> mediocre might, might be, be too nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I can't, couldn't resist um, a chance to take a pot shot at the uh, Brooklyn Nets. So, but yeah, otherwise, I think that's a great point about 
being able to live in the moment because as a fan, this is the most in the moment I've ever really been able to enjoy. This is the best Knicks team of my life. Um, three seed with uh, we are within air shot of a Milwaukee Bucks team that has a pretty rough April ahead of them. If you look at their schedule, they got us, they got the Celtics, they got a couple tough games there. So you never know where that's going to go. But without even talking about the other teams, yeah, just where we are and how good we are. And I understand with the injury concerns for Ananobi um, and the injury concerns to a much more significant extent with a guy like Julius Randle. But what we have on this team is so special. And and I think that's where that's that's kind of where I'm leaning here with the vibes is that the vibes are special and they're special because we are witnessing in real time a superstar ascending and even evolving Uh, last night on the casual or not the casual last night on the the playback that we did with Benji. One thing that I was noting is that we witnessed Jalen Brunson's ascension as a scorer over the first 50, 60 games. And now we're watching him grow as a passer. So we're really watching in real time what Jalen Brunson is becoming and where he's taking the New York Knicks and how every day almost the conversation around us changes. You know, the if you look at a team in the Western Conference that's oh, I want to not really similarly built, but um built around defense. They have enough juice on offense from their uh their offensive superstars and just an overall superstar in Anthony Edwards, the Minnesota Timberwolves, they're a team that lost Carl Anthony Towns at, I think, game like 50 or 55 for him, right around there. The New York Knicks lost Julius Randle around a similar spot, and both teams have been able to stay afloat. A lot of it is because of the superstars that we that both teams have, and that all starts with Jalen Brunson for the New York Knicks. And because we're watching a superstar, it kind of makes you just think more about what are we doing today? How much am I enjoying today? Am I really worried about the conversation has become less and less about who are the Knicks going to add in the off season because Jalen Brunson's here and that is gigantic for us. And then of course, OG Ananobi, Isaiah Hartenstein, Julius Randle, the Deuce McBride ascension. And there's just so much going on on the team right now that you're almost forced to live in the moment. And I think that's special when you're forced to acknowledge what's in front of you because a lot like just the New York Knicks of old just have been denied, denied, denied. And where we are today with these Knicks is just we're in the moment. So, yeah, I think that's that is a an excellent, excellent point that you made. And it led me into where I feel about the where the vibes are, which are special. So, yeah, just getting just moving right along with the program here. You guys know a casual Friday. We do our shout outs and we do our why so and serious. So we are in the shout outs. So we started with GMAC for the vibe. So my friend XJ, give us your first shout out for the casual Friday episode of Nick's Film School that everybody's so excited to be listening to right now. (laughs) I gotta, I gotta start by you gave me a couple corrections. I need to give you not a correction, Mensa, but I just want to point something out. I just want to point out the fact that you told me I made an excellent point, which you soundly refuted when it was your turn. <laughs> you said <laughs> you gave me, you made an excellent point that I completely disagree with, and it was excellent because it allowed me to say how much I disagree. With it. <laughs> I didn't think I disagreed with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying. I was saying I have an inability to live in a moment. Like that's that's uh, like a problem that I have. And you are you are the king of living in the moment, which I honestly am jealous of you for because I think that that's that's awesome. And if I wasn't completely swarmed in anxiety, I'd be right there with you. Um, <laughs> But uh, but going to to my shout out, my I, I think I got a good one. Um, I think I kind of I previewed it. I sent out a quick tweet before we jumped on the pod a little bit earlier. Uh, it might surprise you the direction I'm going. My shout out. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of options. The Knicks have been playing awesome. There's a few low hanging fruit. This one I think is a little less obvious, but still still one of the the, the key options you might choose. My shout out is going to Tom Thibodeau. And my shout out is going to Tom Thibodeau for being flexible. It is not a secret that I hated the non-shooting lineups that <laughs> that Tibbs was rolling out there with Josh Hart, Precious, and Hartenstein. And really, any time Precious was out there playing the four, I just don't think that's a viable way to win in the NBA long term. But you know, my entire thesis on basketball is based on the fact that spacing is like the most important thing in the game. And I know everyone believes that spacing is important, but I think it's the most important and like non-negotiable. And 
you know, I really appreciate Precious Achua. I very much appreciate it. Everything he's done here, he helping to keep the team afloat with injuries, um, just Tibbs simplifying his role and, and helping him thrive to, to make the best contributions that he could. But I will say that the team's success with those lineup constructions, to me, just felt kind of like, um, like it was built on a house of cards to some extent. It felt kind of, one might say, rat fake. I will say that I feel like that line of construction was 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 rat fake. And and you know, the reason why Tibbs gets my shout out is because I think he went with that lineup because he thought it'd be more effective, most effective of the options that he had, and was the least bad of the options that he had. And then, you know, it was sort of exposed against the Sixers. And then Tibbs was willing to pivot to something that I'm sure he didn't want to do, which is not only have an, a lineup whose average height was six foot five when he went to Brunson, Deuce, DiVincenzo, Hart, and the stockbroker. Um, but specifically, he had a lineup that featured three small guards. You know, we all know how reluctant Tibbs was to play Quentin Grimes at the three this year. Like, he just did not want to do it. And that's when he was alongside Dante Di- DiVincenzo, who's six foot four. Now he's playing DiVincenzo at the three alongside a six foot one Deuce McBride um, in a small sample size. This is how this small guard trio is performing. Plus 17.2 net rating when they're all on the court together in over 400 possessions. If you remove the minutes that Precious is on the court, that goes to a completely insane 250 possessions to uh, it, the 200 in 250 possessions to a tune of 30.5 net rating. That includes a 139.1 offensive rating. But here's the craziest part. You guys are going to love this part. The craziest part is that with those three on the court, they still have a 33% offensive rebound percentage. And I don't know if you guys are ready for this. That's higher than their offensive rebound percentage is when Precious and and Isaiah Hartenstein are on the court together. Um, So they don't even lose their rebounding edge. At least they haven't so far um, that they have when they have two bigs. So I just want to be clear. Obviously, these are very small samples. These will harshly correct if and when this lineup plays more. That is just going to happen. Regression is a thing that I just truly believe in. But I also want to say that I do think this is a completely viable lineup when you get OG and Anobi back. And that's why I'm so anxious to get OG back. The guard trio has only shared the core with OG for three possessions. So imagine swapping out Josh Hart for OG. We've seen the, we've seen the results with Josh Hart in there for most of the lineups. Imagine you have OG instead next to Isaiah Hardenstein. You'll lose maybe a little bit in terms of like rebounding and energy, but you will get so much back when it comes to shooting, when it comes to the defensive end, when it comes to just additional versatility in terms of guys who can initiate a little bit. I think OG is a little better than Josh Hart. I mean, it's, it's arguable. Josh Hart is a really good passer. So my point is that lineup, I think, is completely viable. I'm so proud and appreciative of Tibbs for being flexible, being able to go to a three guard lineup, a three small guard lineup. That's something that I thought he would just never do. So I'm really at the point where I'm not ruling out stuff that Tibbs might do. I mean, last year I was, you know, I would say, yeah, Tibbs would never do that. And that's not going to happen this year. I think that anything's on the table because he's shown his, his flexibility and his ability to do things that might may surprise many of us. And so I just appreciate that. I think that's going to be really important going into the playoffs. And I just think it's allowed the 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 real coming out party for Deuce McBride and the amazing play that we've seen from Dante DiVincenzo. I think a lot of that is really brought on by Tibbs' flexibility and his ability to kind of go against things that he would have normally not wanted to do. So that's that's where my shout out goes. Tom Thibodeau. A great shout out. And if you didn't, I was probably going to. But it looked like when you said Tom Thibodeau that Andrew was a little uh, flabbergasted and maybe even (laughs) disappointed. So, Andrew, you want to jump in here? It's just like, I mean, we don't tell each other what our our people are going to be beforehand. So um, Tibbs may or may not also be my shout out, but in a different way in just a little bit. Um, The... Look, the sample sizes that you noted, because I, I dug through the lineup data too, and I saw it, it's nothing. I mean, they've been playing some bad teams lately. Also, I think the three guard lineup works, works great if Deuce McBride is just now Ray Allen. Yeah, totally. He's, he's, he, you got to keep him on the court. He was just going to keep making these threes. Guy's shooting 42% from three since the, the trade for Ananobi when he got put into the, the rotation. So, um, I think that. 
the cool thing about it, and I've been, I mean, look, I, I feel bad sometimes because of the amount of places my voice gets heard um, that I repeat the same talking point every now and then. So if you're hearing this for the third time, I apologize. But I think a lot of Knicks fans, myself included, have theorized that like Tibbs is a great uh, floor setter for your organization. But if you want to take that next step, there's some evolution that would have to be done specifically on the offensive end. And our X's and O's experts, you guys, like a lot of us have said, like eventually he's going to learn half, have to learn to be more creative in the playoffs because that's where his, his offenses have, have lost and, and gone to die in the past. Well, the cool thing about him being forced to adapt through all these injuries and find ways, different ways to be effective and win games and experiment outside of his comfort zone is that now he's giving us a different look and maybe even giving himself a different look at things that can work. I'm not saying that the, that trio is going to have a plus 17 net rating forever. I don't think XJ is either. I'm just saying it's a different look that the Knicks can go to in times where they have to boost the offense. There may be moments in the playoffs where they have to go with more size. Specifically, the one game where that trio did not work was when they played the Denver Nuggets, who just like are bigger and stronger and and better against, you know, this this smaller lineup. But like he tried it. Like he he was just, you know what, this worked a lot against the Warriors. I'm gonna keep going. And then after one game of it failing, he didn't go back to like precious at the four against the Nets, a team that's actually a pretty uh, uh, lengthy and deep team themselves, uh, he went back to it and stuck with the the shooting and Miles McBride rewarded him. Rewarded him. So it's almost like it's almost like an evolved Tibbs is your coaching upgrade. And you wonder if come playoff time, if it's a guy that's trying, willing to try new things and give his his roster a chance with its flexibility to attack teams in different ways throughout a seven game series. Look, I his the the intensity he coaches with and the the way his he gets his teams to buy in, that's a team that can go deep in the playoffs. The talent discrepancy may be what decides the Knicks fate at the end of the day, especially if they don't get healthy. But his his evolution this year should have him toward the top of a lot of coach of the year ballots and it should it should give a lot of Knicks fans that may have been skeptical a lot more confidence that like okay there's there's a lot of places that that he can go to now that he's apparently also willing to go to now when when times get tough and that's just it's a testament to him for being willing to evolve yeah that's a great point about just tom thibodeau evolving um but i think it may be one that i kind of disagree with Ooh. because it's almost like so tom thibodeau like XJ was saying, would play these three non-shooting big lineups as recently as like a month ago, right? Um, yes. And now it's, I mean, you're allowed to change. You are. But what I more think of is, is this more credit for Tom Thibodeau or credit to the front office? Because the players were always there, right? And we can say that Tom Thibodeau, like I'm starting to rethink the Tom Thibodeau like conversation where is he a great floor raiser or is he just a guy who can flat out coach, right? It doesn't matter if he, is he a floor raiser or a ceiling raiser. Do you, if you just give him a lot of talent, like the Knicks have done this year, can you get this guy to win a championship? And it's a credit to the Knicks organization that they developed a guy like Deuce McBride, who seems to be like if Emmanuel quickly is one end of the spectrum and Quentin Grimes is the other end of the spectrum of Tibbs acceptable guards, you got to, um, Miles McBride is right down the middle there, right? Where he gives you the point of attack defense that Quentin Grimes gave you and maybe the more reliable shot creation, not as reliable as a shot creator as uh, Emmanuel quickly, but a more, but he's a more reliable shot maker than Quentin Grimes. So to me, he's right down the middle there, which is why you're seeing him start him because, and then once he figures out, oh, Miles McBride is good at basketball. He doesn't take him off the court. Yeah. You're like, playing 47 <laughs> minutes now, buddy. Yeah. And we saw this with Isaiah Hartenstein. Isaiah Hartenstein before Christmas was not starting behind Jericho Sims. That's crazy to me to, th to say today with Isaiah Hartenstein being 21st in the NBA right now in overall EPM. I think he's like 77th in offensive EPM and 99th in defensive EPM. And he was 100th before, I guess, um, Jonathan Isaac 
mm-hmm. met the minutes qualifier, <laughs> which is crazy. But this is a guy that was before he had the the Achilles tendinopathy. He was playing just about 40 minutes a night, night after night in January. So it's like once Tibbs discovers he has a good basketball player, he just becomes a Tibbs guy. Like Deuce McBride was not in the rotation and then gets into the rotation out of necessity. And now he's a Tibbs guy. Same thing with Isaiah Hartenstein, who was behind, um, who's behind, who was basically, yeah, behind Jericho Sims for nominal reasons, not for actual talent reasons, but now he's the unquestioned starter for the New York Knicks. So it's just, is it really, and this is a question I'll pose to both of you guys, is it, with all of that, I guess what I just said, is it really that Tibbs has upgraded his, his like his coaching, I guess, willingness, or is it more that he realized that he has good basketball players on his depth chart? So I think it's, it's twofold because why wasn't he starting Isaiah Hartenstein? It's because Tibbs throughout his entire coaching tenure, not just with the Knicks, but go back to Chicago and go back to Minnesota. He values like things that he doesn't want to mess up his good bench unit to try and make the starting lineup work. It's like, I have this bench unit that works with Hartenstein running the backups. I don't want to mess that up. My comfort zone is that. And I'll just put Sims in and try to survive the bench, survive the starter unit. So that way I can get to my bench eventually. And that is like, that's his comfort zone. Why the whole Emmanuel quickly thing was that he viewed him as this guy that could run the second unit that took advantage of backups. You're going to come in with six minutes left in the first half in the first quarter. And then I'll keep you in for like 10 straight minutes. And then you'll do the same thing in the fourth quarter and maybe you'll close the game. Right. Like he always had that specific structure that he never wanted to abandon. And what this has forced him to do is abandon those safeguards. Now, it helps when you've got some people that he believes in more, like Isaiah Hartenstein, clearly showing that he could be a starting center. Although, I do wonder if the minutes limit has shown him that he's a 25-minute player, which we'll see what happens when he hits free agency this offseason. But like Deuce McBride, like, he's... Tibbs is the guy that fought for the Knicks to draft him. And once he started to hit threes at a clip that we'll see how realistic it is that it stays this way, like that became a guy that he was willing to go out of his comfort zone for because Deuce, like you mentioned, is a Tibbs guy, but is a guy that um, he was willing, like Deuce got put into the rotation last year and it wasn't until the Josh Hart trade happened that he got taken out. Deuce was in the rotation the day after the Ananobi trade and the Knicks even committed to Deuce long term. And then again, Deuce had to earn it. But then by necessity, Tibbs entrusted him. And to your point, Mensa, the moment Tibbs figures something out, he just doesn't stop playing. it. he's like, oh, I'm just going to keep hitting this button because it keeps, you know, giving me the thing that I want over and over. So I think him suddenly having to adjust is a thing that like, we we all remember two years ago. It's haunted us forever, right? But I think him being able to go out of that comfort zone and be like, you know what? Screw my second unit. I'll figure it out later. Or well, okay, no, not screw my second unit. You're now part of my first and second unit. Do some proud. <laughs> You're now part of my first and second unit, Josh Hart. Um, those are the adjustments I'm talking about. Like in the past, I think we're seeing, like you said, Isaiah Hartenstein would have been my his, his starting who was his backup center for Jericho Sims for three weeks. And it took a Jericho Sims injury against the Lakers for him to realize, Oh, this works. So I think that's part of the evolution I'm talking about is that he's, he's looking at it. It's not so hockey shift anymore. He's willing to try new things. Yeah. And I, I don't have much to add to that because I, I largely agree with what uh, Andrew is saying here. I, I, I mean, I just think that, I'm I'm giving them credit because and I'm not saying I'm grading on a curve. Obviously, Tibbs is a great coach overall, but with regard to flexibility specifically, which is what I gave him the shout out for, um with regard to flexibility, I think that he's evolving there. I think that he's evolving there because he has he has these like rigidities that, you know, AC was talking about and I just think that the fact that he's willing to kind of go away from them when he's pushed and we know about rent due tips, he wasn't necessarily in a rent due situation, but he was still able to kind of go away from the things that really make up his comfort zone. And that is what I'm giving him the credit for not saying that he's 
completely evolved and is like a new man and and you know is like not going to go back to these things that make him feel comfortable and we'll see we'll we'll see how it goes in the playoffs we'll see how much a healthy Alec Burks plays over a Deuce McBride if that was ever to come to pass you know if if, if Deuce let's say goes cold for a couple games or a game or something like that so we'll see how it actually plays out in in, in that environment where it's like I got to go with what I feel comfortable with and I don't think he's completely evolved but I do think he's moving in that direction and he's demonstrated that by making some of these changes and that's what I'm given the, the the appreciation for the greatest test of this is going to be when Julius Randall comes back because if Randall comes back and he's playoff Randall and you have other things that have been proven to work that's where the decision making is going to have to come down that hey I understand the gravity he brings you've seen firsthand what going positionless and just putting the three guards out there with Josh Hart or what XJ suggestion of putting them out there with Ananobi or putting Ananobi and Hart together and playing with either Deuce or DiVincenzo at the two can look like, or even like putting Ananobi at the three and, bo- and bogey at the four, like the spacing lineups and what that can look like and how they can work. You have other options now on your basketball team. And from to Mensa's point about the front office being like, all right, we've given you the roster you want. Now you have to be creative with it. And I, I famous last words, but I, I kind of trust him at this point. And the, the way this team has bought into his culture and his, his style of play. I, I, I think that that bodes well for the Knicks going forward. Yeah. Um, so before we get into, um, before we get into your shout out, just a really quick question. Um, just buy or sell. Deuce McBride is a shooter. It's not my it's not my uh shout out, but I'm buying it. Okay. Okay. XJ. Yeah, I'm buying it. Bye, 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 bye. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm buying it too. I think he's he's just made the volume has been insane. And at this volume, maybe he's not um a 42% three point shooter, but I think we've seen enough over the last three, four months to say that he's a good shooter. So yeah, I'm buying yeah. for sure. All just right, Andrew. Real yeah, quick. go ahead. When I say buy, I just you gave me two options: a binary, a buy or sell. So yes, if adding the caveat that I don't think he, I don't buy forty two percent from three on high volume. I don't think he's one of the best shooters in the NBA, but I think he's a good shooter, and I think I think that he'll make shots throughout the rest of his career. All right, yeah. So Andrew, let's jump into your uh, shout out. So my shout out is somewhat for Tibbs, but it's also like whole team related. It's like Nick's culture is really what I want to give a shout out to. And part of that is Tom Thibodeau, but part of that is Jalen Brunson. Part of that is Leon Rose. Part of it is the University of Villanova. Like part of it is just what they've built here. And I I need to just like stress it to people that they've traded one first round pick in the last two years to assemble this team. And it was a protected pick for Josh Hart. And they, they, you know, I've done some of it through the draft. They don't have a max contract on the roster. Like DiVincenzo was signed for just above the minimum. Deuce McBride is on a bargain contract. Um, I believe, I forget who put the, it's probably a Tommy Beer stat, but um, the combination of Deuce McBride, Isaiah Hartenstein, and Dante DiVincenzo combined their average annual value, ad, average annual value for what they'll make this year is less than what Fred Van Vliet made alone this year. And that's not a commentary on Fred Van Vliet, but like Houston had to overpay for to get a solid point guard in there. And the Knicks just, I mean, maybe through some relationships, maybe they tampered a little bit. Who, eh, who, who can really be the judge of what happened in Dallas? Who knows how they got Jalen Brunson? I'm going to say they signed him legally on the day of free agency after the, the, the moratorium had lifted. Who knows? We weren't there. Point is, they've really built something here. And I think it's shown specifically... Um, on January, let me get the exact date. Uh, it was a Saturday. The New York Knicks were playing the Miami Heat. Um, it was January 27th. And they won that game. But in the latter moments of that, the fourth quarter, when Jaime Hawkins Jr. decided to step up and take a charge. And it was a dirty play. But it's also a play that Jalen Brunson does all the time. But I'm not going to let that context mess up my slander of the Miami Heat. <laughs> um, I it, it ended up dislocating Julius Randle's shoulder. OG Ananobi disappeared after this game too with the mysterious elbow injury and the Knicks became extremely shorthanded after this. Uh, Isaiah Hartenstein going down also had something to do with this. Quentin Grimes spraining his knee. The Knicks 
being um, left with uh, trading for two Pistons. I might have also kind of shorthanded them too. But in that stretch, they were 29 and 17 and they were the four seed on January 27th. And in the next 26 games, the Knicks went 15 and 11 and rose to the three seed. Julius Randle has not played a single game since then. OG Anobi has played three, which means if you take away those three wins that he's played in, they're 12 and 11. They're over 500 without an all NBA player that's a three a three-time All-Star, and OG Ananobi, who by all accounts might be the most impactful human that's ever existed. Um, that's what the Knicks have done since the trade, or since those injuries, since they've been been uh, shorthanded, since they've been handicapped by what usually are injuries that wreck seasons. Two examples that we've just seen in the NBA. Look at what the Sixers were. They were a top three net rating team when Joel Embiid went down. I get it. That's an MVP level player that went down, but that's how they built their roster. That an MVP level player was that important. And I get it. If the Knicks lost Jalen Brunson, it probably looks similar, but I wonder if the Knicks would have survived it better than the Sixers have because the Philadelphia 76ers are 10 and 18 since the day Joel Embiid went down and have dropped to 23rd in net rating or have the 23rd worst net rating since that time. The Cleveland Cavaliers lost Donovan Mitchell recently. They are 8-12 and in games he doesn't play. Since the All-Star break, they have the 22nd worst net rating in the NBA and have fallen to fourth, maybe even fifth potentially, if, if the Orlando Magic passed them in the Eastern Conference. The Knicks lost two players and rose in the standings. Two other teams that by all accounts, according to league to the league uh, talking heads, have been built competently or, or two gold standards. Someone wrote a book about the Sixers losing a ton and was like, bravo. And you know what? The Knicks, without needing to tank, except for RJ Barrett, that was one season, just built a family here and built a culture. And they're able to survive these injuries instead. And it's a testament to Leon Rose, to the head coach that's got all these players to buy in, the next man up mentality, the Jalen Brunson, the leadership that has been shown. It's Josh Hart willing to play 40, 50 minutes a game. Um, it's just it's just a really cool to see this team overcome these injuries. And now we'll see you uh, knocking on any wood that's nearby as we're starting to get healthy because Mitchell Robinson's back and who else might be around the corner. Um, now they're ready to ascend even higher up the rankings. And we'll see what happens with Milwaukee. But just a shout out to the Knicks and the culture that they've built that they could survive such a massive blow like the one that we've seen them survive this season. Yeah, I think that is just an excellent point because like I was saying in my shout out, the Knicks have been so good that you kind of just focus on, <clears throat> excuse me, that you kind of just focus on what's happening in the moment. That's also a negative in this case because you're not necessarily seeing what's happening in Philadelphia or in Cleveland that we are directly benefiting from, right? The Knicks have built such a great culture here um, in terms of the next man up mentality and just our ability to, you know, to stay afloat. And now that we're finally getting healthy, like it's, it's trouble for the rest of the league. And the culture we built here is just so great. And the best part about it, I would say, is that we didn't need to put stupid words on a court in order to prove to everybody that we have a great culture here. <laughs> so, so, yeah, um, XJ, you have anything you want to say about that? Yeah, no, I think that was beautifully said by by Andrew there. I, I just, you know, I think it's incredible just looking flatly at the year long numbers. And it's it's so interesting looking at kind of like year long net ratings and efficiency and all that stuff because it encapsulates everything that a team has gone through. And so that's so interesting. Like you just get this crystallization of like, this is what your season was. It doesn't really say who your team is or who the essence of your team is, like when they're fully healthy or, you know, you know, everything's bundled in back to backs, injuries, exhaustion, you know, all kinds of things, how much your coach plays your, your best players, all those things are bundled into your, your yearly long um, season stats. But, what everything the Knicks have been through, top ten offense, top ten defense. <laughs> that just that's that's crazy. Yeah. Let me, what, what, let, me, let me piggyback on that extra. Yeah. When they when do. the injuries happened on that dreaded January twenty seventh day, they were the fourth seed. They were seventh in defense. They were eighth in offense. They were fifth in net rating. Now here on almost exactly two months later, 
They're the three seed. They're seventh in defense. They're tenth in offense. They're fifth in net rating. They barely moved in the rankings, and they still have a top ten offense. Still have a top ten defense. I agree. Incredible. So I yeah, I think I just definitely double down on everything that AC just said, and I think it's yeah, it's just an awesome point. It, the the one thing I would say is that. And I would, I'm not, I don't know, knock on all the wood in the world. I, I don't want to see this. I was going to, it almost slipped out of my mouth. I would like to see what the Knicks would look like without Jalen Brunson for an extended period. I would not like to see that. I do not want to see that. I knocked on everything. Trust me. I got a wood desk in front of me. It's, you know, I, I, I knocked a hole into it. It was like a woodpecker on this thing. But I, I just think that the Sixers situation to me is more alarming how bad they've been without Joel Embiid. I don't think that's and Mensa, you've pointed this to this out before. You can't be that bad without your best player. You can't just turn. I mean, and to be honest, the Nuggets are kind of in a similar situation with the Nuggets without Jokic are terrible. They're just mm-hmm. awful. Like that you you can't be so contingent on your best player. And I think the Knicks wouldn't be good without Jalen Brunson. And but also a little bit of credit to Cleveland because they have not been good with without Donovan Mitchell, but they haven't been the Philadelphia 76ers. They've been able to stay afloat. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that that's that's the only thing that I would kind of throw in there is just the fact that the, the, the Sixers are one situation. I think the Cavs are a little different, but yeah, I, I overall, I agree with your points for sure. I think, it, I think- they're, they're well made. I think the, like you said, the Sixers are built around one guy and we saw it fall off the cliff. I think the Cavs, what we've seen recently with uh, your favorite player, Evan Mobley and their uh, Darius Garland is they reverted back to the nine seed that we saw from two years ago. And uh, look, I just, I can't get over the fact that the Knicks, like, yes, Jalen Brunson is the engine and he makes us believe in miracles, right? Um, we also have seen teams load up on him and then the Knicks adjust like them be able to. And this is where like Isaiah Hartenstein becoming a rising star in, in the EPM ranks and just in, on the Knicks this year has helped them figure out new ways to succeed. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I'm just impressed that they actually rose in the ranks during this. The, they were a four seed when this injuries, these injuries started and now they're a three seed. That's crazy. Plain and simple is just amazing to me, you know? Yeah, and I want to be just really clear about Isaiah Hartenstein um, because it's not just EPM that likes this guy. <laughs> Basically, all the stats that are not um, PER love Isaiah Hartenstein. All mm-hmm. of them. So he's just been, he's been excellent. 100% been great. Um, yeah, that's really all I wanted to say about uh, Isaiah Hartenstein because you are on a panel with the um, the two co-founders of the Startenstein Club. So mm-hmm. uh, we are very proud of our boy Isaiah Hartenstein, um, our bright skin friend, as he likes to um, call himself, if you haven't seen the rumor, I'm sorry, the Roommates podcast. So yeah, I just want to jump in really quickly to my shout out. I'm not going to take too much time here because my shout out is more of a celebration. Celebration of one Mitchell Robinson. Mm. who came back and played 12 minutes last night, gave us eight points, two rebounds, um, missed none of his shots, three for three from the field, two for four from the um, from the free throw line, but that's always been Mitch, gave us two blocks, um, not so great, the three turnovers and the two personal fouls, um, a plus 14 in a game that we absolutely annihilated the Toronto Raptors or what's left of them, I should say. Um, just want to shout him out really quickly because one, he's back and he makes bench look bench units look like fourth graders. I love it. It's so wonderful to watch him just be just bigger than everybody. It's a great feeling. Um, but more importantly, Mitchell Robinson on April 1st um, celebrates his 26th birthday. And usually when you're se- when you're an NBA basketball player who has started games and was on the tear that he was on to start the season, essentially about to turn in one of the greatest offensive rebounding seasons we've ever seen in the history of the game um, for him to have the humility and the camaraderie with a guy like Isaiah Hartenstein to know that he's going into his athletic prime um, Most commonly, an athlete's prime is accepted as their age, um, 26 to 30 seasons. I think that's starting to change just with the longevity that guys are starting to see, but mostly between 26 and 30. And this guy's okay coming off the bench, completely okay with it. 
I don't know if that has anything to do with, you know, he his just medical situation. But normally a guy who's a starter isn't OK coming back to the bench. Right. Like this is almost like Tony Romo and Dak Prescott, where Tony Romo was a great starter and then gets hurt. And then Dak Prescott in his rookie season just takes the job and never looks back. Not quite the same because um, Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson are a month apart. And one was drafted in 2017. The other was drafted in 2018. So similar um, experience. But I'm just so happy that Isaiah, not Isaiah, that um, Mitchell Robinson doesn't want to upset the apple cart. And I think that's really valuable on a team like uh, you said, GMAC is building such a great culture, this Knicks culture here. He's buying into it. And not just that, but then he, he knows he's going to dominate. Right. It's not. And he's not worried because. He, the Knicks have taken care of him. He is in, I think, the second of a four-year contract, a descending contract, which is, again, shout out to the New York Knicks for handing out great contracts um, as, as far as um, the front office side goes. But it's just a wonderful feeling to, to know that a guy like Mitchell Robinson, who is an excellent, excellent basketball player, and he reminded us very quickly, I think in that first six minutes, then he had two blocks and he was just right back to being his old dominant self. We haven't gotten the rebounding quite yet, but there was a point where I was wondering if the Toronto Raptors were ever going to get another rebound in the game. Just watch it. How um, it was so refreshing to see how great he's been. But more importantly than the production to me is the mentality because we do not take, we do not take into account often enough how one guy's personality can kind of like ruin, not ruin, but kind of like really put a thorn in the side of a team in what they're trying to build, which is why you see teams avoid the um, the veteran, the, the 14, 15 year veteran who has nine to 10 all-star appearances because of the drama that comes with him, right? With the Knicks, you don't have to worry about that. The Knicks have a group of guys who have all bought in and Mitchell Robinson is just another example of how this culture and how this team all believes in the greater goal. And I just want to shout Mitchell Robinson out for one coming back, but also coming back and, you know, being okay and comfortable coming off the bench. Um, XJ, you want to jump in? Yeah, that's a huge shout out. Big shout out to big Mitch. It's just crazy to me. Like the first thing I thought about when seeing Mitchell Robinson coming off the bench and the, the Toronto thing is a little unfair because they are underhanded as well. And you know, they, their backups are sort of like a bunch of players who have played very few M- NBA games in their careers. So it's a little unfair. And that's why it looked like he was playing, you know, a man, a man among children, um, <laughs> which is just really funny to watch and to hear Darko talk about it after the game and just pointed out like, yeah, that dude's big. He's really big. And we weren't. Um, so it's pretty funny, but it just is the this amazing, amazing situation that we have where we have this huge monster of an offensive rebounder who is dominant in the paint on both ends in terms of grabbing boards and protecting the paint and protecting the rim. And he's going to be coming off the bench and playing second unit players and second unit centers and second unit fours and fives trying to box him out. Like it is an unbelievable situation. Like I can't think of a situation like that in recent memory, honestly, where you just have two very high level, high quality starting, starting centers that are both on the same team that are just going to shift time and both do a lot of things very similarly well, but then also have other extreme strengths that the other doesn't have. So it's really incredible the situation that we're in. I'm so happy to have Mitch back. I think I, I couldn't wait for it to happen. And yeah, I just think that's a great shout out. Yeah, I got that much to add. I think it's really cool that they're just like best friends, Hartenstein and Mitch. And so Mitch rooting for Hartenstein in the starter role. And there's no, there's no ego. There's no, you know, I, the, the, the mentality of the starting quarterback coming back to his job. And then, you know, Tom Brady's now the starter, Drew Bledsoe, but uh, a recognition that the the team is what matters more. And what's even cooler is hopefully that leads to a payday for Hartenstein on the Knicks that it's like, I'm rooting for my boy to get paid on the team that I play for. So um, yeah, shout out to Mitch. Yeah. I, again, he's just been, it's been great. And um, to your point, XJ, about a team that just off the top of my head, team that had two really high level starting centers, um, I would have to think of the the Nuggets before they realized who Jokic was and they were starting uh, Yusuf Nurkic ahead of him. And even then, I would probably say that, um, I mean, Jokic is Jokic, but there's a chance that 
what we're seeing this season is a higher level of production than what those two are giving you. And then even like before that, the only thing I can think of is the the championship Lakers that had Pau Gasol and Andrew Bynum, and they would essentially That's a good one. both play yeah. um, center. But one was the starting power forward, so it's a little different. But yeah, it's it's very rare what the Knicks have. It's honestly, who would have thought that a team that at the beginning of the season you had guys like Kenny Smith saying they don't have a superstar on their team, they don't have this, they don't have that, would end up with would end up with two guys in the top twenty one and EPM and an embarrassment in, of riches in terms of what we have with our centers, what we have with Deuce, Deuce McBride being what the, the sixth, the best guard on the team start to start the season. Like it's just, it's unbelievable what this is, what this front office has been able to do. And I mean, it's, it's great that we're at a place at the end of the season where we're talking about playoffs and we still have new things to talk about in terms of shout outs, but we also have new things to talk about in terms of why so un serious. So this segment, you, as you guys know, is our weekly, well, it's, it hasn't been, it's been a little bit longer than a week for us, but um, our shout out where we just, you know, talk about things we don't like and we question why this person, place, thing, or entity is so unserious. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to go first for this one. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off the, not off the rails here, but a little bit, um, might throw a curveball in here. Because my why so serious does not go to anybody who roots for the Knicks, plays for the Knicks, or works for the New York Knicks. It's going to go to one Monty Williams. Ah. <laughs> because my friend. Great one. You got paid $75 million over five years, so $15 million a year, which in Detroit can make you feel like the mayor of the city. But you are not the mayor of the city, my friend. I don't know why you got so offended when the New York Knicks were out there having fun and just Dante DiVincenzo is out there going to break the record. And it's like, oh, this is unsportsmanlike. It's this. It's, <laughs> bro, what's unsportsmanlike and what is worse for the game of basketball is when teams like the Detroit Pistons decide that, you know, wins don't really matter anymore. And look, I get it when it comes to because I am pro tank. I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend that I'm not pro tank. But at the end of the day, the NBA is an entertainment business. Dante DiVincenzo went out there and put on a show. The New York Knicks went out, went out there and put on a show. Why? Because we played our guys. The Detroit Pistons are currently not playing some of their best players. I think Kate Cunningham isn't playing. Jaden Ivey was out there. Jalen Duren wasn't playing. All of these phantom injuries somehow, some somehow, some way seem to pop up for the worst teams in the NBA at the at the least opportune times at the end of the season. So if you are so worried about the integrity of the game and respecting the game, put your best players out there and maybe you can stop us. But until you do that, please, when somebody asks you about what another team is doing against your guys, just give the company line. Don't go out there and defend the city of Detroit, who I respect, as everybody knows. <laughs> I have a lot of respect for the city of Detroit. This has nothing to do with the great people of Detroit and everything to do with Monty Williams, who somehow thinks he is your mayor. So I just I just thought that was really, like, whack. Um, and it kind of just feels like he has a thing against the Knicks because I think earlier in the season he had an issue with, I think, um, a call that we got against him. And look, hey, the call went our way. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it wasn't the wrong call, but it happens like that in the NBA. And the New York Knicks are a team that has been victimized by referees the same way everybody else does. Some days it's yours, some days it isn't. But if you ask Monty Williams, it's New York bias and it's this and it's just it, bro, just shut up. You're your team is the worst in the NBA. Um, nobody cares that your team is getting ran rough shot over because everybody has ran rough shot over your team. You broke the record for most losses in a row. Um, it's just not, it's not what we want to hear from you. If we heard it from Dagonault or if we heard it from Missoula or some, or um, Eric Spolstra, you know, guys who currently have respect for what they're doing on their job today, maybe we would take you more seriously, but until now, please collect your $15 million a year in annual salary and shut up when it comes to talking about teams that are better than yours. Thank you, sir. Um, XJ, uh, you can jump in right here. No, that was so well said. Uh, Monty Williams makes more than Mitchell Robinson. 
<laughs> and Dante DiVincenzo. Yeah. And, and, Dante DiVincenzo. and Deuce yeah. McBride. And a lot of guys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I it's totally right. You know, for sure, respect to the city of Detroit. But yeah, I I just the Monty Williams thing is it's so annoying. I I, I don't know if he's just if he's like this after every game, because I don't watch enough Detroit games, but I think it's just on point. I don't have much to add. I just wanted to say that Monty Williams makes a lot of money. That's it. DeAndre Ayton was right. GMAC, you got anything you want to say? <laughs> I got nothing other than when they were calling us crazy that Tibbs should have won Coach of the Year in 2021 and Monty should have instead. I just... Uh, proof is in the pudding. So just here we are three years later and and one guy's turning a four seed with depleted injuries into a three seed and the other guy's complaining that his 12-win basketball team uh, had records set against them. So... <laughs> Receipts. <laughs> Rec- records get set against T- Tom. Teacup frog face emoji, you know? <laughs> uh, GMAC, you want to jump in with your Why So Serious? Yes. So I uh, I know you guys are aware of the phrase Two Americas, so this may cross over the Two Americas uh, threshold here, but um, my chat, uh, Why So Serious goes to Florida, man. Now, I don't know if it originated with the TV show Atlanta, but that's where I was made aware of the Florida Man experience. Um, specifically, uh, beware of Florida Man. Uh, if you go if you go and Google your name and Florida Man, um, weird headlines will pop up. Or not even just your name, your birthday and Florida Man. So I just did my birthday, August 3rd. Uh, Florida Man arrested for manslaughter after hole-in-one photo ID. Uh, Florida man steals alligator from golf course, tries teaching uh, it a lesson by throwing it on the roof of a bar. Uh, just some, <laughs> some crazy things when uh, you, you, you're not too too keen on what's going on with Florida man. And uh, recently here in Nick's land, we've had to be beware of Florida man potentially trolling us about a basketball team he used to cover. Um and then he retired and moved to, to Florida and now likes to point out that the Knicks were going to miss Obi Toppin and whiffed and made the wrong move in signing DiVincenzo. So I guess now that DiVincenzo is about to break the Knicks record, Florida man then doubles down on said take and how they're, they're still stuck needing a shooting guard because Deuce McBride's not the answer. And Deuce McBride followed that up with nine threes against the Toronto Raptors and the 42% clip as we mentioned since the OG and OB trade that put him in the start in the in the rotation and Florida man has done nothing but double down and it's mostly a troll and I appreciate Florida man for the contributions that he's made to the Knicks beat as someone who went to school for journalism I appreciate Florida man's many years of reporting on said basketball team um well Florida man go enjoy Florida otherwise the headline is just going to continue Florida man with axe to grind continues to tweet from cell phone that probably still has a keyboard on it. So um, shout out to Florida man. And uh, for those who don't know who I'm talking about, if you know, you know, beware of Florida man. Yeah. Beware of Florida man and his um, Blackberry that he's probably. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh Oh, man. Yeah. um, I think that's wonderfully said. Um, when you retire, like, leave the game alone. You know what I'm saying? Walk away from the game. I'm just letting or- you know now. I think I speak. If, when I retire, the internet won't exist where I am. I'm not talking to anybody. It's going to be me and my wife and a DVD player. I swear. <laughs> Listen, I mean, when you when you get away, like, let the game miss you is what I would say. The game can't miss you out there in Florida because you haven't left it alone. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's kind of all I'll say. You know, just let the game miss you, my friend. And Maybe one day we'll talk about you fondly. As a, Flor- another Florida man, not in this context, but XJ. And I was, I was going to say, I, I didn't know if I was being attacked here with the Florida man. No, I'm no. I'm just kidding. I, I, I obviously knew it wasn't about me. Um, yeah, Florida is an interesting place. Um, I think being down here, for those who don't know, I am I currently live in Florida. Being down here does weird things to your brain. Um, and I think that this may be a case of. It not doing something to this person's brain, but just enhancing whatever is already there, and and then that can happen. And we just see extreme behaviors tend to come out of people who live down here in the humidity. It's like an Amazon rainforest down here. I'm I'm, I'm not joking. And so, you know, that things happen. Who knows? There should just be some experiments done 
uh, you know, I think on people's brains, a la CTE studies or something like that. But mm. you know, I just I just wanted to give a, that commentary as someone who lives in Florida. I know there may be some things going on that others who don't have the pleasure of living in the swamp uh, know what's going on. Unfortunately, that would require for the state to believe in science to do those studies, <laughs> XJ. So if only we could then get to the conclusion of what those effects are. But alas, so. Um, Anyway, I mean, you're, you're they, wouldn't publish, they wouldn't publish the data anyway. So that's true. Yeah. They wouldn't because that would require books, and we don't allow books in our. We're not going to let a silly little thing like books mess up our our state anyway. Yeah, without uh, getting <laughs> without getting too political, um, science is one of many things the pe- the great people of Florida do not believe in. Um, so yeah, with that being said, <laughs> XJ, you. <laughs> Not to get too political, but here blatantly is what <laughs> XJ, your wife. Oh, no, hold on. You're you're hosting. My bad. I got a hands off. Go ahead, X. XJ, my friend. Um, as a Florida man, um, you want to get into the thing that, of the Knicks that you're not believing in this week? Uh um, why is not serious? <laughs> uh no, you know what I think? It's funny because we we talked a lot about Florida. There may be another we talked about Florida. We talked about the city of Detroit. Respect to the Uh-oh. city of Detroit. Um, there may be another shot coming at a different city that you wouldn't expect. First, I want to say we should definitely make a rule that when the Knicks go eight and three over 10 games and they figure out how to get that extra win out of a 10 game span, we should always do why so unserious is outside of the Knicks um, because I like this. I want to say the Knicks have been so good. It's hard to pick a, a, a why so unserious. And I could go a certain way and talk about the next player. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the show killer over here. So for my why is so unserious, I'm going to go and this is going to be quick, but it, it's, it might hurt. Um, it might hurt someone. I'm going to go with the NBA schedule makers. So I'm going with the NBA schedule makers because why are 50% of my last six games going to be against the Chicago Bulls? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like maybe this is dumb and I should be thanking them and be like, thank you for giving us three wins in our last six games. But I don't want to subject myself to watching the the Chicago Bulls. We talked a lot about mediocrity a little bit earlier in the program. This is the quintessential media. I don't know who's more mediocre, the, the Atlanta Hawks or the Chicago Bulls, but they're they're fighting for the title. They're fighting for the throne there. And this is with all due respect to the city of Chicago, which is not much. <laughs> Chicago has always been a wannabe New York. Honestly, like I just I'm not a fan. If they never had Jordan, I don't know how we would think of them, you know, not just as, as an NBA city, but as a city I've been there and I'm just like, this is fake, like Midwestern wannabe New York. Um, but I don't know. My point is that I just feel like the thing I have to be most sad about in the Knicks world is that I have to watch three bulls games. And I, a lot of this comes back to DeMar DeRozan, who I think is a really good, a really great basketball player in a lot of respects, but There are a lot of teams that I like to call clone teams where they lose a guy who's redundant with their other guy has very similar skill sets and they get better because they get to more evenly disperse like the usage and they get better defense from other guys who play their roles a little better. The Chicago Bulls lost Zach Levine and they're the same. They're just mediocre still. They just are the same. They just they can't not be mediocre. I don't I don't understand it. It's crazy. And I think a lot of it comes back to DeMar DeRozan, a great mid-range shooter. The Knicks have a guy who's a great mid-range shooter, but you know what? He also takes a lot of threes. He's also elite at taking threes. And DeMar DeRozan is a player who refuses to take threes. Like he is abjectly just I will not do it. And you know what that gets you? Mediocrity. So shout out to the NBA uh, the schedule makers who have given me the beautiful blessing of getting to watch 15 DeMar DeRozan mid-range twos go up uh, for three nights of the last six Knicks games. And I get to enjoy that beautiful sight as we walk our ways in the, into the playoffs with three pretty easy wins, I would say. So that's 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 my why so unserious. That's future Hall of Famer DeMar DeRozan to you. There's a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, <laughs> the Hall of Very Good Hall of Basketball. That's the Hall of Basketball. Did you play basketball? All right, you qualify for the Hall of Fame. That's what the Hall of Fame is in Springfield. You know, uh, the Chicago Bulls. Um, they had an opportunity once upon a time when I think they were selling on Jimmy Butler, and they could have, you know, decided to reset. But what they chose to do instead was commit to mediocre. Right. When they traded for Nikola Vucevic, like they could have had all these first round picks, but they said, you know what? Let's go be mediocre. 
with <laughs> Nikola Vucevic. <laughs> what did it earn them? I think they won one playoff game in the three six matchup against the um against the Milwaukee Bucks. They got one mm-hmm. playoff win out of it, and then they said, "You know what? We're going to double down. We love this mediocre thing that we got going here." And then they lost in the the play in tournament, I believe, to. Who is it that they lost to? Doesn't really matter because they were mediocre that season too. And no, 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 no. We have to call them out for why they lost because you know who they lost to? Oh, yes, I do. They lost oh. to the Miami Heat. Exactly. Had Miami- a lead in the fourth quarter and oh, we my- were subjected to the Miami mm-hmm. Heat mm-hmm. after they didn't hold on and win that yeah, game. And Zach Levine went crazy in that game. But you know what? Making the playoffs is too much success for the mm-hmm. Chicago Bulls. <laughs> they have to remain <laughs> mediocre, right? And it, it's funny that their franchise player is a guy like DeMar DeRozan because DeMar DeRozan could be really good if he shot threes. But you know what? He'd be really good, yeah. He refuses to do it because being mediocre means everything to the city of Chicago. Are so, we sure? Hold on. Are we sure that he can shoot threes? If, if he learned how to do it, yeah, right. But- <laughs> We're, at this point, is he just not like an elite mid range guy? And that's he's, like what he's going to be good at. But DeRozan is so committed to being mediocre that he only shoots from the mediocre part of the court. Like he's, he, he's, See, he's that's committed. why that's what the unseriousness of the, the shout out is here, XJ, is that DeMar DeRozan is the personification of everything you don't like about basketball. It's mid range shooting, it it's is. mediocrity, it's. 15 mid range shots a game. Yeah. No defense. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I, I understand and I empathize. I get it. So, yeah, very mediocre, um, very mediocre basketball team. I haven't been to the city of Chicago, so I can't say if it's mediocre, but according to XJ, it's a very mediocre city and um, mediocre franchise player. And that's not necessarily a knock on DeMar DeRozan. I want to be very clear because to be a mediocre franchise player in the NBA, you have to be very, 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 very good at your job. So shout out to DeMar DeRozan for being very, very good at his job, but also just good enough to be mediocre. Um, so, yeah, I think that brings us to the end of our episode of Casual Friday. I uh, just want to <laughs> shout out Sean with the W. We miss you today. Um, keep doing your thing. Um, it was great meeting Zach with an H for the first time at our T-Squared social um, meetup. So I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing some more of those. We want to shout out the fine folks at T-Squared Social who are also a sponsor for us. So shout those guys out. Um, I'm Indeed. not sure of all of our sponsors here, but we got a, a lot of them. And I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, you've heard their commercials by now. So shout out to those guys as well for paying the bills around here. Um, GMAC, you want to jump in here and uh, help us close out? Yeah, just thank you to again to to you two for um having me here. I will say I opened the start starting about baseball. Um I don't know if you want to reverse course XJ, but apparently while we were recording, Juan Soto had a very thrilling uh throw home in the ninth inning of the Yankees win on opening oh, day man. that prevented a run from scoring and tying the game. Uh, so the, uh, maybe I'm maybe we're wrong. The Yankees well on their way to 100 wins. I commend the Yankees on a fun opening day victory. So. Yeah. Actually, oh, you want oh. me to like like close out with like other stuff too? Yeah. Follow us on social and everything. And shout out to Unified probably for sponsoring <laughs> this. Shout out to Squared Social. Um, shout out Follow to the casual crew. Uh, we got a pregame pod with uh, someone who covers the Spurs dropping on Friday morning uh, a few hours after this drops. So uh, stay tuned to your podcast feeds and your YouTube channel uh, where we just hit 15,000 subscribers. Thank you everybody for, for helping us reach that milestone. You too as well should be celebrating that because uh, we were at like, like just above 10,000 when casual Friday started. So uh, you guys have been along for the ride for a third of that. And hopefully for the next 100% of that as well. So yeah, to the moon we go. To the, to the moon we go. Let's go. Yes, of course. And I'll see you all on the watch along tonight uh, for the San Antonio Spurs game. It's going to be Me awesome. Too. I'm excited to, to be watching that with you, GMAC. And then uh, the big game against OKC. I'm very excited and looking forward to it. And then you'll hear all of our thoughts, mainly, mainly John's thoughts on the post game show after that. So super exciting. A uh, couple of days of Knicks basketball coming up still, too. There you go. All right. So that wraps us up uh, for another great episode of Casual Friday. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. Do you guys enjoy your Friday or whatever day that you are listening to this? And yeah, can't wait to watch. If you're listening to this on Friday, I cannot wait to watch Mitchell Robinson take Wemby's lunch for the second time this season. (laughs) So yeah, thanks thanks again, guys. And Knicks Nation, let's ride.